When describing or discussing evolution, sometimes it's easy, easier to narrow in your discussion at the small scale level or the large scale level. When scientists are talking about small scale evolutionary changes, that might be described as microevolution. And that's when you're talking about evolution at the individual species scale. What's going on in this particular group of squirrels in this particular park, for example? And microevolution can be caused by four factors. Often, a population may be under all four of these factors' influence. One would be mutation. Obviously, if you've got a group of squirrels in a park and some of them undergo some mutations and they start developing, say, lighter spots in, in amongst their hair, that would be a genetic change, i.e. evolution within that squirrel population. Gene flow, which is a term that means essentially migration, if, a, if all the spotted squirrels then leave to go to some other park, well, that's reduced the genetic diversity within that population. Therefore, it's undergoing genetic migration. On the other hand, if some uh, blonde squirrels come into the park, that's adding yet another genetic change into the mix. Genetic drift. If you've only got, say, three of our spotted squirrels in your population of 100 squirrels and all of a sudden a tree branch falls on one of them, you just destroyed 5% of your population. You went from 15% of your population being spotted to only 10% of your population. That's a random genetic drift. It wasn't caused by the spots attracting a branch. And then there's natural selection. If it's easier to see those uh, squirrels when you're hunting squirrels, because you can say, look, I spotted one. That would reduce the number of spotted squirrels. Therefore, that would be microevolution within this population. A lot of times, though, you'll also be talking about the macroevolutionary scale. Now, that's when you're talking about how did this particular group of organisms that include squirrels and groundhogs or whatever things that belong to the group that squirrels belong to, how do they branch off of the rest of the mammals? Because mammals include things like bears and dolphins and squirrels. But if you've ever looked at a bear, you're unlikely to say, wow, that looks really closely related to a squirrel. How'd that come about? There's two hypotheses or theories to explain how groups diverge from each other. And one of them is called phyletic gradualism. And that's the idea that if you start with some common ancestor, you have slow accumulation of changes over long periods of time. If this one ancestral group led to species A, B, C, D, E, F, and G, with D and G being extinct species, how do they come about? Well, you have these slow accumulations. You started getting differences in the two populations of the universal ancestor here, and those slowly accumulated over long geologic periods with lots of transition species. But why don't we find those fossils? Well, obviously, becoming a fossil is kind of a rare event. The chances of any one of you watching this video becoming a fossil are almost nil. You have to land in the right pop, uh, conditions, not be eaten by scavengers, that kind of stuff. I mean, look at all the KFC you've eaten. It's very unlikely that every drumstick bone is going to become a fossil. So the explanations for why you don't find so many uh, transitional fossils here is because the fossil evidence is incomplete. People are finding new fossils every day, and maybe we'll find. Uh, kind of a transition species Q here. Right? That's different from the idea of punctuated equilibrium, which says, hey, species don't slowly change like that all the time. Instead, a lot of times, if the environment stays the same, why mess with success? So a species will stay similar and it'll only undergo change often due to drastic changes in the environment, like, oh my goodness, there's a flood, and it wipes things out. This would be something that a scientist might predict will be happening due to some of the oil spills in uh, the Gulf of Mexico, for example. Numbers of species are being affected by the oil, and who knows what effects those will have, and it may cause some new species to arise pretty quickly and suddenly, because only the weird mutants may have an advantage in those conditions. Earlier, if you're a weird mutant that could eat oil, the chances of you surviving were very low, because there wasn't a lot of oil in the water. Now there is. Now you're not at a disadvantage for spending the energy to get the ability to eat oil. Now you've got a major advantage. While those who are covered with oil and can't eat it off, they die. So that's the idea of punctuated equilibrium, where you have these sudden branchings. And this explains why you don't find a lot of transitional fossils. It's because you were in one condition and then something happened in a quick period of time. You branched off from this species into species A and B. 
Now, you got to be careful here. When I say quick, I'm talking quick in the geological time scale. Quick could be 30,000 years, i.e. being quick, whereas long periods of time, that could be millions of years. So be kind of careful that you don't get caught up in this geological time scale.